just like housing, you can have conferences funded one of two ways. You can either have uh, people pay or you can have a subsidized conference. This has been a subsidized conference. And uh, I'm going to take about 30 seconds to tell you how that, the subsidy happened and then introduce our speaker. So um, Emil Haddad is the founding chairman of Five Point Realty, which is probably the largest mixed-use developer in California with projects in Orange County, in Los Angeles County, in San Francisco. And um, they made a generous gift to USC, to the USC Price School, about three years ago, one of which, among which was a provision to put on what was called a Disruptive Dialogues Conference. And then COVID hit, and so we were having, we were disrupted, but no conferences. Um, but then, as I started becoming involved with a group of the Twilliger Center, thinking about international issues with housing, and I'm not sure if Mario is the one who wrote me into it, or Arthur, or somebody, but um, I started thinking that this issue of the interaction of housing and the broader economy is something that doesn't get broad enough discussion. And so maybe it would be kind of disruptive to try to raise its profile. And so I asked um, Emil Haddad, who again was responsible for this gift, whether that would be within the spirit of what the gift was. And he said, yes, that would be the case. And so we have to thank Five Point for most of the money that was involved to make this happen. We have the Twilliger Center to thank for the rest of the money involved to make this happen. So thank you to you both. Um, Emil is a genuinely visionary guy. I mean, if you look at what he has done with his developments in California, they're unlike anything else in terms of thinking carefully about, as we economists like to say, internalizing externalities, thinking hard about spillovers in these very large developments and how they interact with each other. But he's also visionary in that, well, a lot of us need our econometric models in order to try to figure out anything, and they still often fail us in terms of trying to forecast. He actually says stuff that proves to be true. So often, I find it quite astonishing. Like in February of 2020, at a meeting of our board, he said, this COVID thing is going to be really, really bad. And I thought really bad meant like six months, which is sort of where I was at the time. And Emil said, eh, maybe 2023 is when we completely come back from it. I'll never, and this is one of like several gems he has dropped over my time knowing, I don't know how he does it. Um, I think he does have an econometric model in his head he, and he's constantly reparameterizing it. He just doesn't need a computer to, to run it. Uh, and so I find his commentary always very worthwhile. And so we're pleased to have uh, Emil Haddad for some remarks. Right now, Emil. Well, I'll tell you how I do it. You survive 11 years of civil war and you develop an instinct that actually allows you to see a little bit ahead of time. My mom always used to say to me, the trick to surviving is being one step ahead. And I figured that out over the years. Well, first of all, let me, Richard, let me thank you for putting this uh, conference together. This is one of the most informative, intriguing uh, conferences I've been to. Uh, and uh, I've been watching the young generation, and none of them have fallen asleep so far, so they must be very interested in discussion. Uh, and uh, you follow a group like the one that talked, and as, as Richard said, I'm not an economist. As a matter of fact, probably I was voted most likely to not succeed by my teachers in, in school. Uh, but, uh, and to tell you how much I am you know, I'm intimidated by some of what is said. Uh, after the first uh, uh, session and when we went to break, I asked uh, the people with me if they know what a ear dummy is because I felt like a dummy because I had no idea what ear dummy was. And then uh, we looked it up, and even after I read it, I couldn't figure it out. So, <laughs> so anyway, look, I, um, I don't measure up to any of the discussions that took place, and I don't spend my time. Uh, really uh, doing that, I'm not equipped. Uh, however, I, I, I'm a student of demographics, and I'm a student of history. I, uh, I got uh, lucky in that I, I grew up, 
I've been living in two places that couldn't be uh, further uh, apart in terms of how they, how they actually were built. Uh, the first 28 years of my life, I grew up in a city called Beirut, Lebanon, which was uh, organically built over thousands of years. And, uh, and, you know, we lived in a community that uh, was very close to each other. We all were around the American University of Beirut, which is where I went and studied civil engineering. And uh, the building I lived in had uh, residential. We had families. Uh, some were wealthy. Some were taxi drivers. We lived in the same building. We had a little hospital. We had a bank. We had a tailor and two uh, boutiques. And uh, that was how every building was in our neighborhood. I walked to school and uh, never asked anybody whether they were wealthy or not. Lived with my parents until I left at 28. And even when we came to America, we lived together for five years. And, uh, and the war was, took place for 11 years when I was there. I lived through it for 11 years. And there was this sense of a safety net that you had a community that was always going to be taking care of you. We had a family that unfortunately lost their home. And, and I, I didn't think of it at that time, but they lived with us, a, a mother, a father, and two children. And they lived in our apartment for five, six years. And uh, we didn't have a big apartment, but that's how we, we functioned. And then, you know, circumstances drove me to leave the old country. And, we all got on a plane almost overnight and, and came to America and uh, lived together for five years. We left everything behind. And I got involved in the, in the world of development. And I was a, can a kid in a candy store because this was the mid-'80s in California. You know, Palm Day and Moreno Valley for people who heard that. And, you know, I came from a place where the projects were a building at the time. Now I'm seeing, you know, deserts turn into cities. And I was fascinated until I started trying to understand what's different. And, um, and I came to a conclusion, right or wrong, that um, the reason why we grew differently in America is because we had a perfect storm that took place that drove growth for the last 70 years. We had infrastructure that was built to create jobs after the Depression, which basically induced growth. Uh, a lot of highways were built in California. There's Highway 5 that was built. Not only it opened up areas for development, but it actually forced farmers to be reassessed based on highest and best use and, and forced them to become developers. We had the US government subsidizing mortgages. We had dual income, and we had a population that was enamored with the automobile. All of that drove suburbia to start growing. And um, whereas the factories moved to the cities, and cities became very unattractive to live, those who could afford to move to suburbia started to move to suburbia until they were not able to afford the home in the first or second ring in suburbia and started moving further and further and further. And I remember by 1989, People were leaving their homes at 4 o'clock in the morning to drive an hour and a half, two hours, and sleeping in the parking lot in downtown LA in order for them to, uh, to get a piece of what at that time was defined as the American dream, which is what the white picket fence. Kids were left behind. Uh, drugs moved in. And we started realizing that in the process of this growth, we actually not only caused a lot of environmental issues, but we also started seeing major social issues being developed. And unfortunately, as we, as we started looking at fixing those issues, we started fixing them in silos. So when we realized how much the miles driven and the factory caused the environment, we decided to fight growth. And movements started pushing back on growth. Uh, because rightfully so, they were focusing on the environment. But in the process of that, we started creating 
you know, inequities at the social level, probably the best example today of it in, is homeless and homelessness. And, and as I started looking at what, what went wrong, I started realizing that I think simply what went wrong is that there were groups that had a passion about one element and they wanted to fix it, but every time we tried to fix it, we created an unintended consequence of creating some other damage somewhere else. So, fast forward the movie, by 2006, I was the chief investment officer of the largest publicly traded home building company in the United States, a company called Lunar. We were moving 30 families into a home every hour, and it was a crazy machine until it wasn't. In the meanwhile, we were a group of ours, and Lynn, who was my chief operating officer and later on the president of the company I founded, was with me and has been for 23, 24 years. A group of us uh, started incubating a different business. We actually went and started buying decommissioned Navy bases that were uh, shut down. And we were interested in them because they happened to be in major markets. I mean, San Francisco and Orange County. And um, we wanted to see if we can actually use the critical mass and the fact that we don't have to wait for an economy to come to us to prove up a different way of living. And it was really a simple thing that we started looking at things holistically. We started looking at every component and making sure that as, as we're thinking in every component, we are also have an eye on, that, on what it means to everything else. So we started looking at how do we build communities for three generations? Because we don't want to send our elderly to the desert because they can't afford to live and then, and then have to deal with their mental health and all that. So, you know, that's really where the discussion with Richard started, is we started looking ahead and realizing that as, as the fourth revolution, industrial revolution, is disrupting everything, we need to start thinking about the space differently. And I use the word space, because as much as everybody used housing today, I tend to believe that we need to start thinking about the space also holistically. The word housing, came from a place that really was born out of the Industrial Revolution. Housing became a separate asset class, and we had started hard zoning, and we started putting people living in one place because it wasn't nice to live in the city, and then people worked somewhere else, and people shopped somewhere else. And um, I, I worked with the governor on, as an advisor in the state, a couple of governors, and, and I was asked the question, what would be the one thing you would do if you were to start a process of change? And I said, I would do away with hard zoning. I'd absolutely do away with hard zoning. I would change everything to a one mixed-use zone and let the market tell me what I should build. Because how can you start talking about environmental justice and carbon footprint when you're still forcing people to live one place and work somewhere else? And if we're going to try to start thinking, and that was why I asked the question, I mean, if we're going to start thinking about affordability of housing, I don't think it's going to be in downtown LA in high rises. I think it's going to be somewhere in the Central Valley with a, with a high speed rail that gets you to downtown in 20, 25 minutes. If we're going to start thinking about solutions that are really more social in nature, we really need to start thinking a little bit different than, than how we did it before. So when people ask me, so what's different about the company and about our thinking, I say that when I went to School of Engineering, interesting enough, not one project they gave us, they told us about the people who are going to be actually living or working in the place. We were designing an abstract. And we decided the company to do it in reverse. We start from the people side, the social side, and then design accordingly. Because if we don't do that, we're going to fall into the same mistakes we fell. They're going to be a little bit different because the nature of you know, the, the, few, the coming 100 years is going to be a little bit different. And look, I 
have concerns about the U.S. I actually am very much in tune now because I decided about a year ago to step down as the CEO of a public company and not to spend any more time talking to analysts on Wall Street about why you know, I'm doing certain things certain ways and spend time on things that I really like. And as a result of that, I'm now spending time internationally helping other countries think about how to, to develop. And interesting enough, you know, we were the model back in the 50s and 60s. We created planned plan cities. We actually had public policy on, on housing. We had subsidy of housing. We had public schools. Today, the, you look at the inner cities and we left them behind to rot. And now we're trying to go back. And going back is not going to be easy. So, you know, what we do, just to give you a feel, because we really don't have the answers. But we're trying to see, see if we can actually play around with things and, and ask for collaboration. We don't, we don't develop. We actually invite people to come help us think about development, whether it is academic, whether it's every project we have is a pub public-private partnership. So we don't look at the public sector as regulators as much as we look at them as partners, because if we're going to solve issues going forward, it's not going to be with one entity saying this is the policy and the other you have to execute. We're going to have to start looking at it as a partnership. And today, we are building public schools and giving to the public system. Whereas everybody now has given up on the public education, we believe that that's the way to bridge the gap in social equity. We're believers that it's the way to get up. I stand here as a good example. If it were not for my, my education, I wouldn't be able to stand in front of a group like this and speak to them. And I think that's how we're going to have to do it. We're going to have to start thinking about things holistically. Uh, we have to start thinking about healthcare as part of a community. Believe it or not, I spent the last six, seven years thinking about, and we have now, you know, world class cancer centers and all that within our communities. I've been thinking about how do I actually tell people who live in our community that they can actually have their healthcare as part of their mortgages? That if I actually can put them on a program of education and monitoring by the best healthcare, and nutrition and everything else, I can go and argue with an insurance company that these people deserve a lower price on their insurance and package that and make it part of a mortgage. Why can't we do that? Why do we want to keep on fighting on, on healthcare issues when we can solve it you know, in, in simpler ways? So I'm not here to say anything except to say I, this was great. I learned a lot today. Uh, I even learned what a ear dummy is. Maybe you'll explain it a little bit more, to, but, but at least I have an idea what it is. Um, and, um, and, and, and you scared me, because when I looked at the brochure, it says the elephant in the room, and my picture was below it. So I was like... <laughs> uh, but all kidding aside, look, I, uh, I'm the person who's actually on the street trying to figure out uh, what's going on. And... Um, I don't know if a linear city in Saudi Arabia makes sense or it doesn't. I've been asked that question because I'm involved in that part of the world right now. I really don't. And I'm sure it's not going to be built the same way that we saw the renderings. But I have to applaud a thought that says we're one of our whole economy is based on oil and we're thinking beyond oil. We're thinking about sustainability. We're thinking about a city that might be as crazy as 105 linear city that has a monorail that goes back and forth, and therefore people are going to start being a little bit more conscious about the environment and how they live. It's not, to me, it's not what I see in rendering. It's what I'm seeing in people who are willing to challenge the status quo. So, you know, when, when I was asked about the title and I said, you know, we used to say disruption before COVID, and I said it's a revolution, because really, that's what we need in real estate. We need to start having thinking of real estate as, as basically a total paradigm shift, which is one of the definitions of revolution. I don't mean a, a hostile revolution. But if we're not going to start thinking about it that way, 
I think we're going to start, we're going to keep on going a little bit on the treadmill. So that's my pitch. Happy to a answer. I'm, I'm sure you don't have any questions for me because, but, but I will, but I, I, as I said, I want to see more of this. That's why we did the, what we did. Because if we're not going to have the think tank of having people who are economists talk to planners, and talk to public sector, and talk to private developers who actually are doing it, um, we're going to keep on talking to ourselves. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> One of the frustrating things for me over the many years I've been in the affordable housing space is the power that NIMBYs have in this country. You talked about lack of zoning, which I think is Houston, Texas. But um, any thoughts on how we overcome the resistance of people who are, I think we're all somewhat inherently selfish, but we don't want other people near us that are different, that are poor. And it makes it very hard for us to build affordable housing in communities of opportunity because we're just zoned out. Yeah, well, first of all, the good news is we're starting to see Yimbis now, which is yes in my backyard. And believe it or not, it's people my generation who's realizing that when I was in NIMBY, I, I, was, I didn't know that what I was doing is driving my kids not to live next to me. And now you have all these people who were fighting against growth who want to have their kids live next to them and they've moved to a YIMBY. But look, so let's look at what, what does the NIMBY do? The issue is not the person who's saying not in my backyard. The issue is the elected official who's not willing to act because the person who's saying not in my backyard is his vote or her vote. So what we really need is we need leadership at a public policy making that starts thinking beyond two and four years, which honestly is the one thing that scares me about us as a country today is we're not thinking anymore about infrastructure for 20, 30 years. And we're not willing to take the risk as leaders to say, I don't care if it is popular or not. If we don't do it, we're going to fall behind. It, look, it breaks my heart that we put the first man on the moon. And everything that's innovated in this country is being proven up in Shanghai, in Mumbai, and in Dubai. I mean, I, I, so to answer the question is, it's not an MB. I don't care if somebody doesn't want me to live next to them or, or build next to them. But if the person that, who was elected to serve does their, his or her job, then NIMBY's voice doesn't matter. Yeah, but the, the concern that I have about that is that they're all, it seems like everybody wants to be in office forever these days, particularly in Congress. And they've got donors. And the, the NIMBYs, the people who are already established and have homes, they have the money, so they're the donors to the politicians. You know, the, the people who would live there, if yeah. they could, are voiceless and they don't have any money. And so money talks, it seems to me, too often. But let me tell you, um, so ask today big companies, ask Salesforce, ask any of these big companies, what's their biggest challenge? And they'll tell you housing. You have a huge companies that are having a trouble housing their own people. Those have money. If we get organized with people who have the pockets and, and have the same common interests, and that is to provide an ability for the employees to come in and live, that's the biggest challenge they have right now. So I think the answer to your question is, I've been in this industry now for 37 years in the United States. We're not organized. We don't, we don't actually go and, and educate. We just whine. The industry just whines. That's why I love this partnership with Richard. Because if I now want to go to a governor or a, or a policymaker and say, this is why I think it should be happen, if I have something with the stamp of this group on it, it has much more credibility than mine. Emil, thank you very much. <laughs>